this series of uh, uh, fascinating lectures in nationalism. We have Professor Prabhat Patnaik. Uh, I don't need to introduce him because I think he holds some kind of a record in terms of the number of lectures he's taken within the classroom and outside the classroom in this campus over the years he's been here. Uh, he, uh, if I recall right, uh, afterwards uh, came here, he returned from Cambridge where he gave up his job to come and teach here, reflecting the kind of uh, commitment uh, and excellence which characterizes a lot of people who came to teach in JNU from that point of time and created this university as it is. And therefore, I think it's appropriate, uh, like others who came before him, that he speaks to us today. Thank you. Thank you. Friends, I have been traveling a lot. Uh, I went to Calcutta, I went to Bombay, I went to Tejpur, everywhere I go. The fact that I'm from JNU is something which makes people sit up and take notice of me. <laughs> That's, and that is precisely because of the kind of resistance of which this particular meeting is actually an exhibition. And therefore I'm very gratified that in this list of lectures you have called me to uh, speak as well. As Chandru said, I have given innumerable lectures. In fact, at a rough reckoning, I have probably given more than 4,000 classroom lectures in JNU, but nothing like this. And as a result, it's a unique experience from me as well. Uh, when we typically, the term nationalism is always discussed as if it is a homogeneous category, which is wrong. All of us would draw a distinction between the nationalism invoked by Hitler and the nationalism invoked by Gandhi. But even though we do that, in a good deal of the literature, a good deal of the conceptual literature, this distinction is not drawn. As a matter of fact, the entire trajectory of nationalism in Europe was very different from the kind of nationalism that came to prevail in the third world in the course of the anti-colonial struggle. Europe was a place where the nation, nation state, nationalism, they came into vogue in the 17th century after the Westphalian treaties which ended the 30 years war and the 100 years war. This nationalism which came into vogue in Europe had, to my mind, at least three very important characteristics. The first characteristic is that it always looked at an enemy within. The Jews everywhere, Catholics in Northern Europe, which was Protestant, Protestants in Southern Europe, which was Catholic, and therefore there was always a nationalism which picked out an enemy within. It was not an inclusive nationalism, but it was actually a nationalism that was directed against an enemy within. The second feature is that it was a nationalism which was actually imperialist from, it, from the very beginning. Uh, Oliver Cromwell, within days almost of the Westphalian treaties, invaded Ireland, which was the first colony of conquest in the world. And then, of course, we know that in India, elsewhere, the colonial powers who in Europe were living in peaceful coexistence of sorts at that time were engaged in struggles in Karnatic here and so on. We, we know that, therefore, there was all over the world a struggle for empire, and that was a part of that nationalism. That nationalism was associated with imperialism from its very inception. And the third feature of that nationalism, to my mind, is that it actually apotheosized the nation above the people that it was not the people's living standards, the people's conditions of life, which were important, but something called the power, the prestige, the wealth of the nation. This was not only true of the mercantilists, who anyway believed in grabbing as much as possible to raise the nation's wealth, grabbing from other countries, that is, but it was even true of classical political economy, it was true of all the different bourgeois strands. Adam Smith's book, after all, was called an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations. Wealth of nations had to be raised even though nowhere in the wealth of nations is there a suggestion 
that this increase in the wealth of nations is going to benefit the people at large, the working people. So the nation was apotheosized above the people. These features basically made European nationalism essentially an aggrandizing nationalism. In fact, countries which acquired nationhood rather late in history, Germany being the classical example, felt excluded from this universe of aggrandizement because by that time the world had been more or less divided up between the English and the French and so on and therefore pursued a particularly aggressive form of nationalism and that aggressive form of nationalism at that time when Germany became a nation was associated in any case with financial interest, finance capital which had become prominent within capitalism at that time and all this was manifested of course in the world war which was between rival financial oligarchies and a well-known social democratic writer Rudolf Hilferding who wrote a book on finance capital said that the ideology of finance capital is the glorification of the national idea. And this national idea, many of you would have read Eric Maria remarks, All Quiet in the Western Front, basically is the kind of thing which was captured and this national idea really got intensified through the war and reached its apogee under fascism, which in fact really raised it to the highest possible level. But fascism was the apogee of an aggrandizing nationalism. By contrast, when you look at countries like India, where nationalism developed as a part of the anti-colonial struggle, nationalism had to be inclusive because you are taking on the might of an imperial power. This might of the imperial power could be taken on only if the people were united and consequently it had to be an inclusive nationalism. It tried to bring about a situation where everybody was a part of this nationalism, as opposed to, as I said, the enemy within that characterized European nationalism. Because of which, incidentally, even today, in Europe, in progressive circles, in the post-Second World War period, nationalism is a dirty word associated only with the right. While that's not the case in countries like ours necessarily, because our nationalism, being a nationalism that was anti-colonial, had to be inclusive. It was inclusive as far as the people in the country are concerned. It also had an enormous sympathy for nationalisms of an anti-colonial kind which were developing in other parts of the world. It had to have solidarity with the struggles of other people against colonialism and consequently it was a nationalism that recognized the validity, the legitimacy of other nationalisms rather than excluding them because it was a part of a common anti-colonial struggle. But the third and the most important feature of this nationalism to my mind is that it did not glorify the nation above the people. And, 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 and to my mind, the classic quote is from Gandhi who talked about freedom consisting in wiping away the tears from the eyes of every Indian. In other words, the idea was the people, that, that the, the, the nation was not above the people, nation was about the people. And therefore, these were some of the ways in which our anti-colonial nationalism was fundamentally different from the aggrandizing nationalism that developed in Europe and reached, as I said, its, its zenith in the period of fascism. But all this nationalism of the third world, not only India, elsewhere in the third world, had another feature which is very important because in order to be inclusive, in order to bring in people into the anti-colonial struggle, it actually produced a kind of social contract. You look at the Freedom Charter in South Africa, you look at the Karachi Congress resolution in India and elsewhere also, this kind of nationalism was really based on an agenda which in a sense was an agenda of inclusion, as an, an agenda of democracy, an agenda of egalitarianism. The Karachi Congress resolution, for instance, for the first time talked about universal adult suffrage 
being the basis for the formation of governments in post-independence India. It talked about many things. It talked about equality. It talked about juridical equality, equality before law. It talked about secularism in its own way, that the state will have no religion. It even talked about, it talked about abolition of capital punishment, by the way. And it also talked about, I mean, abolition of capital punishment, which is very opposite at this time because we are talking about Avzal Guru and Yakub Memon and so on. And in 1931 Karachi Congress resolution, it was stated that free India will abolish capital punishment. And it talked about free and compulsory primary education, which we still really don't have, and so on. In many ways, it was really a charter. And that charter constituted a kind of implicit or explicit social contract on the basis of which our nationhood was formed. In other words, it was a nation which consisted of the people coming into nationhood, forming a nation state, to replace the colonial state or attempting to form a nation state to replace the colonial state. This was very different from, as I said, the aggrandizing nationalism of the European kind. Now, from the very inception, this inclusive nationalism really had a lot of internal enemies, as, were, as, as it were. One very obvious enemy is that if you are talking about equality, if you are talking about equality before law, if you are talking about universal adult franchise, in that case, you are really dealing an incredibly powerful blow to the millennia-old caste structure in a situation of institutionalized inequality that had prevailed in our country for millennia. To talk about the fact that the Dalit would have the same political rights, the same vote, having the same value as the Brahmin was really something which was a, a revolutionary statement. And the fact that it was done in 1931, let's not forget that in France, universal adult franchise came in 45, and in India in 1952. But it was visualized in 1931 itself. In Britain, universal adult franchise still had not come, though in 1928 women got the vote, and therefore there's substantial extension of the franchise. But the idea that you actually have everybody having an equal vote and therefore choosing the government together was something which was really a revolutionary concept as far as traditional India was concerned. In fact, you know, I come from a village in Odisha and I remember the 1952 elections in which it, the fact, I mean, we, we, my village had a lot of Brahmin landlords. They were scandalized that their vote would have the same value as the vote of the Dalits who happened to be in that village. So, so it, 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 it was really a major, substantial change. And obviously, this substantial change had its own enemies to start with, traditional society, and particularly the Hindu Tuvadis. Our JNU, one of my colleagues, Professor Suvira Jaiswal of the History Center, has argued to my mind very persuasively that the essence of Hinduism is the caste system. That really, there is, you know, I mean, anything else can be altered, but the essence of Hinduism is the caste system. And the fact that you actually had a situation where a modern India was coming up that dealt a, a, a conceptual blow against the caste system was from the very beginning anathema as far as they are concerned. Many people, by the way, tried to look at, I mean, you know, I'm, I, many people tried to look at the egalitarian tradition in India. Of course, there was a subterranean egalitarian tradition, but the basic dominant tradition, which was that of a society based on caste system, was inegalitarian. So I think looking at modern India, as in some sense a continuation of, tra of traditional India, is something which I really don't share very much. Modern India is one which, in which people are, as it were, raising themselves with their own bootstraps in order to constitute a nation, and it comes into being in the course of the anti-colonial struggle. The second kind of enemy of this uh, inclusive democratic egalitarian nationalism, which was a part of the anti-colonial struggle, of course, was came from capital. Now, one can say that capitalism, because of its inherently 
inequalizing tendencies is really incompatible with the coming into being of such a nation. Because if the idea is egalitarian, then of course capitalism is not the way to do it. The, and in fact, whether you look at Gandhi, whether you look at Ambedkar, whether you look at Nehru, they all believed that somehow capitalism is not the solution to India's problem. Each of them had a different idea about what the solution was uh, in, in terms of the economic regime. But all of them were united on this because they could see that capitalism, which is basically inequalizing tendencies, was really not the answer to the kind of modern India based on a new social contract that was coming into being. Uh, for a while, as we know, what we tried to develop in the Nehruvian era was a controlled capitalism, a regulated capitalism, in which the idea was even though capitalists are there, they would be so hamstrung, they would be so tied up because of controls and regulations and so on, that uh, uh, really they cannot do much damage, that in some sense we pull away with the inequalizing tendencies of capitalism. But of course with neoliberalism, that was not true to start with, and with neoliberalism, even those controls have all gone, and now, as we know, in these few years, inequalities have risen dramatically, and you have the formation of a new corporate financial oligarchy, which is much more aligned to the advanced countries, which is much more aligned to global finance than having anything to do with the Indian economy seen as an integrated unit. Our corporate groups go and buy companies elsewhere, they go and, 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 and take over companies elsewhere, just as imperialist countries, companies try and take over companies here. So, so you have a situation where you have the new corporate financial oligarchy obviously emerging as a major opponent of that inclusive concept of nationalism because that inclusive com concept of nationalism is fundamentally in opposition to all that neoliberalism stands for. Consequently, these two, these two, namely on the one hand, those who are Hindutvavadis, who are defenders of the caste system, whether they admit it or not, I mean, no matter what, 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 what stances they adopt, fundamentally, they are defenders of the caste system on the one side, and of course, the modern corporate financial oligarchy on the other, they come together, and they come together to do a trick. They come together to oppose inclusive nationalism, and they do so through a trick. And that trick consists in the fact that they substitute an aggrandizing nationalism for the democratic, egalitarian, inclusive nationalism. And that is what I mean by saying it's very important to draw distinctions. You know, this is happening every day. Yesterday, I saw in the papers that uh, Mr. Jaitley has accused Rahul Gandhi, saying, what is this? Your grandfather or great-grandfather Jawaharlal Nehru, he talked of nationalism, Rajiv Gandhi talked of nationalism, Indira Gandhi talked of nationalism, but you are hobnobbing with the anti-nationals. You see, the nationalism that Nehru talked about and the nationalism in terms of which those that Rahul Gandhi is hobnobbing with are considered anti-national is not the same term. In other words, there is, there is a deception whereby the notion of nationalism as an inclusive, egalitarian, democratic uh, concept is substituted by an aggrandizing nationalism and the moral high ground that the former occupies is then sought to be claimed by the latter, saying that this is something which, which really we stand for. No, what you stand for is something very different from what Gandhi stood for. In fact, Gandhi was insistent that 55 crores of rupees should be handed over to Pakistan, which was due to them, against a lot of pressure at that time, including inside the Congress. So what Gandhi stood for as nationalism was very different from what you are calling nationalism. But you know, this verbal trick, is playing a very important role in misleading people and we should be sensitive to that. The second thing which, 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 I, which I want to draw your attention to, say two more points then I'm through. The second thing which I want to draw your attention to is the following. That if it is a nationalism based on a social contract, implicit or explicit, in our case, you know, I mean, even though there was an explicit document, it is understood that there is a kind of social contract on the basis of which modern India comes into being. Then how do you ensure that this contract is going to be honored? 
how do you ensure that actually there is no violation of this contract, at least by the dominant segments of society, the dominant groups of society, the dominant regions inside the country? There was a very simple answer that Lenin provided to it, and Lenin's answer was that in big overarching countries, which consist of large numbers of different linguistic ethnic groups, you allow the right to secession. If anybody feels that the contract is being violated, then such an entity must have the right to secede. And the fact that this right to secede is recognized would also make the dominant segments not do things that would make people secede. Now, of course, in India, the right to secede was never a part of the Constitution. Kashmir has a special status, but the right to secede was never written into the Constitution. But precisely because it is not written into the Constitution, it's very important that violations of the social contract, whenever issues are raised about such violations, must be discussed. In other words, there must be an openness through which people can raise issues about the violation of the social contract upon which the modern Indian nation is based. Now, if that is the case, then calling somebody anti-national, in my view, is against the spirit of this inclusive nationalism. In other words, one of the features of this inclusive nationalism is that the category of somebody called, being called anti-national just should not exist. Now, this is not, okay, I'm, I, I know that, they, that, you know, this is not just a conceptual fact. As a matter of fact, there have been, in the past, a great degree of tolerance. There were transgressions. I, I believe Sheikh Mohammed Abdullah's arrest and so on was a transgression. But the point is that, nonetheless, there was a degree of tolerance. For instance, for a very long time, the CPIM, the biggest communist party in the, in, 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 in the country, actually had, in its program, recognition of the right to secession. They changed it much later in the 70s, and on the grounds that this might be used by imperialism, not on the grounds that this is anti-national. When Jyoti Basu became deputy chief minister of West Bengal in 67 and 69, the party he belonged to actually recognized the right to secession. And nobody said they were anti-national. Nobody said you can't become deputy chief minister of West Bengal because your, your, your party is anti-national. So the fact that in the course of a people becoming a nation on the basis of a social contract, which is, as I said, egalitarian, democratic, and so on, many people would raise voices that the social contract is being violated is something which is to be accepted, which is to be recognized, which is to be tolerated. And, 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 and typically, the ideal in India was to tolerate all this. The fact that we're not doing so today is because, as I said, we have moved away from one notion of nationalism to another notion of nationalism, from the inclusive anti-colonial notion of nationalism to an alternative aggrandizing notion of nationalism. This aggrandizing notion of nationalism, to my mind, is the ideology of the corporate communal alliance which currently rules the country. And it is a very useful ideology because once you say, once you say uh, national in this aggrandizing sense, and anybody who does not subscribe to your view becomes anti-national, it's a process of destruction of thought. Because, you know, any thinking must be associated with raising questions. And when you raise questions, there will be multiplicity of answers. And consequently, in any society at any given time, there would always be people holding all kinds of different views. If those views are suppressed on the grounds of their being international, then you are ipso facto sub destroying thought, ipso facto suppressing thinking. And if you do that, then effectively you're putting pebbles into people's minds. And once you do that, then you can say that national, well, okay, you know, observing Karwa Chauth is national and not doing so is anti-national. <laughs> Eating beef is anti-national and so on. So, so that, you know, then you can shift the discourse in a way where national then gets identified with the practices of the Hindu religion. Now, this destruction of thought is, 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 is really of a very serious kind. And what is more, it is not surprising that the most 
excellent institutions in the country, whether it's the Pune Film Institute, whether it is the uh, Fine Arts Department of MS University, Baroda, whether it is JNU, of course, whether it's Hyderabad Central University, whether it's Jadapur University, which is really an excellent university. You, 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 you find that these are all the places where the attack is taking place. There's another feature about these places I want to draw your attention to. They're all publicly funded institutions. You don't find opposition arising in private universities, private institutions. I'm not blaming those students, but because they already have got commoditized. In other words, the process of destruction of thought is something which has already got institutionalized there. The few places which, because of their publicly funded character, still constitute locations of critique, of discussion, of intellectual excellence, are the places which are now being targeted. Now just imagine if a government actually destroys the best institutions of the country, destroys thought, effectively then what are you doing? You're making the country parasitic on foreign countries for ideas. And these are the people who are talking about nationalism. You know, in other words, really speaking, you actually make yourself completely dependent upon imperialism for ideas and then you talk about nationalism. So the struggle that we are engaged here in JNU is one which really is for exposing this aggrandizing nationalism, which is for defending thought, defending the critical tradition which has been built up here, striving for excellence, which alone is a guarantee that we would be able to respect the social contract on the basis of which this nation was formed. I wish you all success. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I think we can take a few uh, questions from the uh, audience. So those who have questions, they can raise their uh, hand. So please be in brief. King Sook, then. Uh, sir, I have two very brief questions. Uh, firstly, you talked about how uh, capitalism is a inherent contradiction to the kind of democracy we envisage. Now, sir, uh, Professor Kalyan Shandal in his book has argued that because we have this kind of democracy, even in a capitalist structure, uh, the, the people who, are, who get economically excluded from the uh, development process uh, has to be the state, uh, in other words, the state has to ensure uh, the, uh, like uh, they, are, they are leaving, at least. Uh, in response to which, uh, a lot of uh, 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 sort of uh, an argument comes, notably from uh, Professor Amit Bhaduri, says that the journey of neoliberalism is actually to destroy not only the economic existence but also the political existence of this periphery. So I want to know uh, your views on that. And uh, secondly, a uh, 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 sort of linking question, you talked about even in the first generations of nation states how finance capital was a driving force. Uh, so I just want to know uh, in a little brief manner that what exact uh, links between this nationalism and finance capital have this today. You know, the first thing I'd like to say is that uh, Kalyan argument supposes that there has been no absolute impoverishment of the people in this country. Okay. But on the other hand, in fact, uh, Utsa's work and my wife Utsa Patnaik's work uh, on nutrition, as you know, has shown that there has been a remarkable deterioration as far as nutrition is concerned. Uh, so, uh, I mean, many people then argue that this nutritional deprivation is because of choice. But that's not true because all over the world, as people become better off, the nutritional standard improves. It's, to my mind, quite likely that privatization of education, health, and so on has basically made such a big impact on people's budgets that they are forced to consume less. Okay, so so I think this whole the, the, the basic presumption that nobody has become worse off is a presumption that I would not accept. Uh, your second point about uh, finance capital, you see. 
the initial nationalism was based on mercantile capital. As a matter of fact, even though nationalism began in the post-Westphalian period, already in Elizabethan England, you know Shakespeare's famous this thing about the Emerald Isle and so on, but already you have whiffs of nationalism in Elizabethan England, and that's associated with the struggle against Spain for primitive accumulation, for, for, for looting and so on. So, so the point is that, that nationalism gets associated with mercantile capital in one stage, industrial capital later, when you have free trade policies being imported, imposed on, 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 on third world colonies because you want to sell your manufactured goods, get all the raw materials. And finance capital at the later stage, I think only in the turn of the beginning, end of 19th, beginning of 20th centuries, it gets associated with finance capital. And Hilferding, as I said, argued that the ideology of finance capital is a glorification of national idea. Thank you, thank you, sir. Excellent lecture. My question is related to 1931. You said Congress giving voting right to all, and the French, the the, the and, uh, French uh, 1945, and just used uh, you 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 told in your village the Brahmanas Dalit. Just I, in the France uh, voting right concept in the first French Revolution in in, in 18th century, the French government the gave voting right to men to all. Just I, I am saying to this, this at this time British rule, the British rule in the uh, rule of law and the political rights, they they are ready to give to all in, uh, political polit political rights. So and the uh, before two decades. The, uh, the periods and Dr. Ambedkar movement in, in the second uh, round table conference, Dr. Ambedkar uh, uh, got uh, double voting and uh, uh, separate electoral the, from the British. So Congress uh, 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 the just uh, uh, did not uh, the, the uh, so that the, he is anti Dalit. So the, the, he, the Congress party recognized that the uh, uh, voting right to all. I want your comment. No, you know, please, I, I, I'm not saying the Congress party gave voting rights to all. I, I'm saying that the, okay, let's put it this way. India's anti-colonial struggle took off in a very big way in the 30s. Okay. I think the cause for that had to do, in my view, with the distress of the peasantry during the Great Revolution and so on. But when it took off, it took off on the basis of a certain agenda. Prior to that, nobody had defined what is free India going to look like, okay? That agenda was prepared and it was passed in 1931. The preparation of the agenda is something which, of course, I mean, I think the left had a very big influence upon it, uh, but the point is that that was the agenda. The voting right actually came with the first, was uh, ensured by the constitution drafted by Dr. Ambedkar and came with the 1952 uh, elections for the first time. In France, the first time that actually you had universal adult suffrage, universal. You know, women had not got the vote even in Britain till 1928. Uh, and, and even after that, there were some kind of minor property restrictions and so on and so forth. But universal ad adult suffrage in Britain came earlier. Let's take it as 1928. In France, it came in 1945. And in India, it, it was there in 1952. The point I'm trying to make is that is that you know, when Europe is breaking out of that old kind of nationalism, we are developing a nationalism that is not the old kind of nationalism, which is an altogether new nationalism. Okay, many European scholars do not recognize it. You know, they they, they actually think nationalism is a dirty word. No matter whether it is nationalism of the National Front in Britain or it's nationalism of let's say the anti new liberal fighters in India or elsewhere. Now that's a mistake because these are two very different terms. You know, I mean, whenever you talk, for instance, about fighting against neoliberalism, delinking yourself from liberalization and globalization, many people say, oh, but that's a reactionary idea. No, because in our context, it has to be seen as a continuation of the anti-colonial, anti-imperialist fight of today. Uh, hello, sir. Sir, uh, in the, uh, I will just quote, sir, in the uh, Perry Anderson, his 
book Indian Ideology. He says that Indian scholars, you know, like to hold to a certain idea of India, which is inclusive and diversity, uh, massive TV and democracy. And he says ki perhaps that's not true. He accuses the Indian nationalism of being a certain kind of Hindu nationalism, which had no respect for untouchables, which had huge massacres of Muslims and he you know talks about partition and while in the formation of nationhood and even after the forming of nation the kind of atrocious laws which were passed and he says there have been a silence and even if you look at the basis of internationalism there is a certain tendency built into it so I want your comments on that uh, secondly sir after the neoliberalism you know you see there is a certain kind of uh, nationalistic tendency which is cultural nationalism which one sees in Japan, Singapore, and even in Indonesia, where a certain kind of progress, which you call aggrandizement of a certain sense, is also happening in third world countries. You know, and it's common. The pattern is common. So, how do you respond to that? I'm glad you 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 raised this question because uh, you see the and the the inclusive nationalism of the third world. You just see, there was a time you had, let's say, Sukarno, you had uh, in Kruma, you had uh, in India, you had elsewhere, you know. The world was dotted by great figures of the anti-colonial struggle. And the world was dotted also by people who are trying to develop their economies in a way that is relatively autonomous from imperialism. Okay. Why is it that all of them collapsed? Okay, let's just look at some of these countries. You talk about Iraq. Iraq had the largest communist party in the Arab world. That was decimated by a coup by Saddam Hussein, which was supported by the CIA. Iran actually had, under Mossadegh, supported by the left, nationalized oil. And they had a coup which installed the Shah by the CIA itself, and then uh, that entire tradition got decimated. Okay, uh, you look at Sudan, the, the largest communist party in Africa. Okay, the CIA staged a coup in which Majoub, who was the general secretary of the Communist Party, was assassinated, and Nimieri was placed there. All over the world. The, 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 the attempt to roll back this inclusive nationalism has actually been done by the US imperialism. When, because of this, that inclusive nationalism, the progressive tradition dies out, and in its place you have Islamic fundamentalism of various kinds, which they themselves had supported. As a means of destroying the inclusive nationalism, they are aghast because like, like Frankenstein's monster, it comes to haunt them. You know, so, so, so the point is that I agree with you that in the third world now, you have all kinds of aggrandizing nationalisms coming up, but many, a, a great deal of the Islamic uh, nationalism that's coming up is also anti-imperialist. So you have very peculiar mixtures coming up. Uh, but on the other, I mean, you, many of these, e, e, even IS, or, or, you know, um, Taliban, you know, how many of them were actually supported and created by U.S. imperialism, many of them have turned against it. But the, but the unique feature of the Indian Hindu variety of aggrandizing nationalism is that it's pro-imperialist. There's absolutely no, absolutely no programmatic opposition. Even I was taken aback by that, you know, because when neoliberalism happened, Swadeshi Jagran, Manchin, I, I thought maybe there would be some element of opposition to the neoliberal agenda arising from the Hindu two forces. Zero. You know, I mean, they were tiny, but, but look at them in power, whether Vajpayee was there or current government. So so the point is that, that Hindu Hindutva forces have never been anti-imperialist. Okay, uh, which is not true of some of the Islamic forces, even when they were supported and propped up by U.S. imperialism. Uh, the and but but as I say, what we see in the third world today is a mosaic pattern, into which U.S. imperialism has put in a great deal of inputs. I'm not saying they they planned this mosaic pattern, but it has emerged because of their interventions. I believe personally that if these Hindutva forces get their sway, you know, if, if their sway continues, if it is the case that we actually have this kind of an aggrandizing nationalism coming up, 
and a destruction of the inclusive nationalism, you'll have a social disintegration of the country. It's, it's, it's not just bad morally. I think it'll, then India would join the ranks of the failed states. Okay. Uh, finally, the question on Perry Anderson. You know, I began by saying that a lot of people don't distinguish between these two nationalisms. And that lot of people is not only the Indian right, but also the European left. Okay. I, I think substantial segments of the European left does not distinguish between these two kinds of nationalism. Perry Anderson is a classic example, like, sub, like the Indian right, you know, which is pretending that this aggrandizing nationalism they are pushing on the basis of which they say Kanaya is anti-national, this, that, and the other, is the same as the anti-colonial nationalism. And they are trying to appropriate, therefore, the moral uh, stature of the anti-colonial nationalism in people's minds for their own purposes. Uh, good evening, sir. As always, it has been quite enlightening, and thank you very much for this wonderful lecture. Uh, you have educated us on various matters, and it was quite analytical. Now, coming to the question, the question is that uh, how do you shed some light on uh, your view on right to secede when we operate in the very concept of nascent state, and when there are ample evidences, the governing forces across the world? It is very difficult. I, I don't think that there are countries in which it can be advocated for that matter, that they have the right to secede for that matter. We have our own inherent contradictions because of the very pluralistic nature of the Indian society. We have bear the burnt historically, have been enslaved by people, have been governed by others and all that. Now, I don't want to take any, you know, I don't have any political positions and all that. There are too many things to touch upon right here on this stage, basically. But since you haven't talked about those, one of the hypocrisy that I see, to be very honest, addressing all this meeting, Sorry for the intervention. Second thing, is that when Jnuta meeting was, uh, you know, hold a uh, few days back, the first meeting uh, as a press conference, I was right here for two and a half hours. There was no mention, unconditional demands were put. I mean, just to bring the neutrality in our discussion and not the, not, you know, uh, coming up with hypocrisy. For two and a half years, not even once, the, what led to precipitation of all these things was not even mentioned for once. I mean, I do, I'm very much proud that all the forces, we, we are basically, you know, portraying to things that are very much important, important nationally that we are standing up to what, whatever occurrences are all across, you know, India, and we are being the force. I'm quite, you know, happy for various things, but I fail to understand the rationality when it comes to, you know, Kashmiri, so I don't want to get into that, to be very honest, but basically, uh, you, all of us know historical tracings of Kashmir and all that, but then why don't we talk of the rights of those people who live beyond that, and I, I mean, I want to talk of POK. That too, if you think of Kashmir, Kashmir is, to me, to my understanding, I must be bold enough and confess the fact that this is not only a political, you know, uh, political uh, issue. It has something to do with, you know, religion also. We have built the burnt of, you know, religious division, perhaps the only nation which was, you know, so I don't want to get into all this, but there are much deeper implications and issues that are to be touched upon, I personally feel. And we, being the you know student community, the whole nation look up to us. I think that our nature, wherever politics come, the reason, the reasoning, and because of biasness, it gets altered. But I think we need you know more introspection on that thing. Thank you very much. So the first thing, and for that matter, if Manu Smith is right there, I do advocate pretty much in favor, pretty much in favor. Wait for a moment. I mean, this is after one month. I'm I'm taking your five to ten minutes, and this is for ourselves. This is including me also. Just a second, my dear brother. If it is for Manu Smriti, I think it is for Vedas too. It is for... Question I asked once. This is this is question I asked once, shedding some light on right to secede about this thing. Then the second thing is that, just a point of inter intervention, that it should be, you know, equally advocated, unequivocally for Vedas, for Quran, wherever, because of the passage of time, something becomes irrelevant. That should be bur burnt, that should be thrown out. That is what. Well, uh, let me just first talk about the right to secession. You see, there are, I mean, you know, the two issues as far as I'm concerned are the following. The right to secession is very important for ensuring that the dominant region, the dominant social groups do not oppress the others. 
Okay. So the right to secession is, is, is essential from that point of view. At the same time, we live in a world in which imperialism uses this. You know, I mean, I have seen, I'm much older than you, imperialism using Katanga to, 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 to try and get rid of Patrice Lumumba. You know, I mean, he was actually killed. I mean, he was, a, he was an outstanding national leader of Congo who was killed because imperialism and particularly a company called Union Minieri actually used Katanga, for, made Katanga attempt to secede and in the process, they tried to split up Congo. So, so, so in a world with imperialism, and similarly in Nigeria, there was this civil war for a very long time in Nigeria and Biafra. So everywhere you actually find that the dominant metropolitan powers intervene to break up third world countries' national unity. Okay. So, so these two have to be weighed against each other. Okay. There may be certain circumstances, therefore, where the right to secede may have to be curbed. Okay, so so I I'm not I'm simply pointing out the pros and cons of the right to secede. We can discuss this, but fundamentally, I said, I mean, my point is the other one, namely that since in India the constitution doesn't give us the right to secede, it's very important that at the very least we don't hold those who are raising their voices for the minorities or for the smaller groups as being anti-national because you know that's that's a minimum guarantee that at least those voices are heard uh, now uh, yeah um, about your other points in you know, i mean what general tanson said is i'm really not a part of it <laughs> You spoke of a singular, you know, inclusive nationalism, but if you look at the documents of the communist movement, the history of the communist movement in India, when the Simon Commission came, they gave a memorandum that India is a multinational country and it has 16 distinct different nationalities. So what is your take on that? Then nationalism as modern nationalism is a product of political modernity, which includes the nation and the nation state. Now, the Marxist theory of state says that state is also a class organ. So, how do you explain the class component of nationalism? Then he also spoke about many types of nationalism, uh, including cultural nationalism. So, what can be a Marxist theory of nationalism? The answer to your first question, I think, has been very well given by Professor Amalind Guho, a well-known Marxist intellectual of Assam who died just a few months ago. He said that in India, you have two different kind of nationalism. You have, a mind, say, say I, I come from Odisha. I have an Odia nationalism associated with the nationality. That is Odia nationality. There's a literature, there's a language. You feel, in some sense, proud. I mean, I personally don't, but, but that's a separate matter. <laughs> but that's, that's a separate matter. But, and then there is an overarching Indian nationalism. He, he actually called it the big and the, and the small nationalisms. His argument was that in countries like ours, matters are very delicate because any overemphasis on the little nationalism to the exclusion of the big one, or an overemphasis on the big nationalism to the exclusion of the little one, can actually damage the entire federal polity. In fact, you know, he, he gave examples. AGP is an example of one kind. Those days, Assam movement, Assu movement was an example of one kind, and Indira Gandhi's centralizing tendencies were an example of the other kind. And each of them can actually damage. So, so you need a very, very delicate balancing of the two kinds of nationalism. Uh, communist movement. Yeah. So, so, so the fact of recognizing India as being a multinational state. In fact, on normal in the Goa's description, you can call it a multinational nation. State. State because it's a, it's, it's, it's a nation within which there are various nationalities. But I would say it's a nation in the making. And precisely because it's a nation in the making, violations of the social contract that constitute the basis of this nation can have a very disastrous uh, implication. As far as uh, the communist movement's general position on the nationalism, uh, nation and so on is concerned, I mean, I think they, for instance, argued that Pakistan had the right to form a separate state. But they did so on the basis of an understanding that the Muslims in India constituted a nation, which was a wrong understanding in my view.
sir thank you for your lecture uh, i have two questions uh, one is you talked about uh, the congress or the nation was ready to give political rights to all the citizens including the dalits but gandhi or most of us know that he believed in the varna vyavastha was he uh negotiating how do you think he was going to negotiate the e economic rights for the dalits because hinduism fundamentally the four uh, varnas have different economical rights how do you think gandhi was going to negotiate that firstly that is a question to be put to gandhi not to me <laughs> secondly you know i i please i i really never would like to use things like someone gave something to the dalits no no i mean that's no 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 even in argument i would not you know listen i see the country as a people at large in the course of a, okay let me just begin a little bit before that you know that i believe that in the early 19th sorry early 20th century late 19th century there were two gigantic movements in india traditionally historians i'm not a historian but you know think of them as separate one was the social emancipation movement of phule periyar ambedkar and so on the other was the anti colonial struggle people tend to think of them as separate entities and then you know it's it's very common to quote gandhi on the on the caste system and to say periyar didn't join the anti colonial struggle later on and so on but but you know i do believe and and this is based on my own personal experience because as i said i come from a village i've seen you know that that um, that these two movements actually strengthen one another at the ground level i see them as influencing one another in other words uh, the fact that the national movement and this the anti colonial struggle that this enormous sweep and was forced in a sense to take a position to work out uh, an agenda that would draw all the people of the country an agenda of egalitarianism was because it was occurring against the backdrop of the social emancipation movement and of course the social emancipation movement also is something that took off because there was a general sense of consciousness developing in the country at that time certainly so so these two movements really helped one another in my view at the ground level and the upshot of that is that in the process of the people becoming a nation on the basis of 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 an agenda equality was a part became a part of that agenda it was a, it was a condition for our nationhood okay uh and i believe no matter what gandhi would have done or said uh fundamentally i do believe that 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 i think capitalist development would undermine that agenda and therefore would undermine that nation for a very long time it was believed that we'll keep them under control okay but already by 1960 nehru sets up the mahalanobis committee to look at the inequalities in wealth and income because already there is a view that these inequalities are increasing okay uh, and of course with neoliberalism we know these inequalities have increased dramatically okay when they have increased dramatically now the corporate financial oligarchy jump you know makes use of communal forces to actually set up an alternative concept of nationalism and that to my mind is what this business of aggrandizing nationalism on the basis of which kanaiya or and or or, or rumor at call anti national that is really a shift in the definition of nationalism and we should expose that to the public Uh, sorry, I have another question. That's all. Uh, so, uh, in I've observed that for a lot of female students, the uh, family, the parents, continue to be worried that their daughters have an opinion on nationalism and on this whole issue. But uh, the reality could be that these parents do not really associate themselves ideologically with the left or the right. They vote because they see direct benefits from voting for a particular party. uh so they see you know make in india and uh, everything else that's happening as something that will further their household as maybe the smallest unit of the nation and uh, that also lends them to continue to sentimentally identify with uh, things like bharat mata and uh, the the general uh, paternalistic attitude of the state toward people so i was just hoping you could uh, explicate a little on the links between the unit of the household as a something that that is a gendered sort of space and i missed yesterday's lecture which was on gender and the nation but yeah so the uh, the nation nationalism and the household as a unit 
no, you know, I, I mean, I'm not really very competent to talk about it, but I do think basically that, okay, you know, I think, I think ideas are basically, uh, let's say, ideas of the establishment, okay, bourgeois ideas, are filtered through the household and come to persons. Uh, I think Jean-Paul Sartre had a theory which actually was, was based on this, that, 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 that fundamentally reaction comes through religion and that religion also is one which is inculcated through the family, family values and so on and so forth, touch somebody's feet because he's old, etc. I think, I think, yeah, you know, I mean, the, those are the ways in which the fact that you must not think for yourself is drilled into people from the very beginning. I think the family is a very reactionary unit. You know, I mean, it's it's it's, it's a fact. I think, uh, uh, and and obviously, gender inequalities are really pushed through the family. I think, however, uh, you can, you know, I'm, I'm not very sure about the relation between nationalism because I think, at one level, the current kind of nationalism is something that can be pushed through the family, Hindu family, and this and that. But it must not be forgotten that also earlier, during the anti-colonial struggle, many people, women came out of their houses and came out of their families and, and, and you know, actually went to jail and so on. You know, so, so that was a, that was, resistance also comes through nationalism of the first kind to the structure of the family. I mean, uh, Kore Bairi, for instance, is something which is about the woman coming out of the of the of the parda, you know. So, so, so I I do think that the dif the two different nationalisms, their difference also consists in how they treat the family and how they treat family values. One would argue against family values, the other would argue for the preservation of family values. Though, as I said, I know very little about this. Sorry, you know, you know you have to talk to some more expert people. Sir, my question is, uh, are crony capitalism Are crony capitalism and radical Hindus are correlated or the same? And uh, are they helping each other and how they are helping each other? Uh, thank you, sir, for the lecture. But I actually have a little uncomfortable question for you. Uh, because I also come from the left tradition and you are like doing of that. Mera thoda sa kya hua ki main Bharatiya Bampanth ke saath juda fir Nepali Bampanth ki yatra kiya. Maavadi Indulan ki yatra kiya. Us par mera kaam hai. Aur mera kya hua ki actually jo Nepal ka Bampanth aap dekhte hain, mujhe kya lagta hai ki jo main niskars par pahuncha hoon ki Nepal ka jo Bampanth hai Maavadi Bampanth, jis par itni aasaye thi bisso ko ek door mein, लेकिन वो अल्टीमेटली जिसको मैं थ्योराइज करता हूँ कैस मावाद कैस मावाद के रूप में पार्लियामेंटेरियन पथ में जाकर के उन्होंने अपना सब कुछ छोड़ दिया और उसमें साथ साथ एक तत्व है जिसको कहते हैं ब्राह्मणवादी मार्क्सवाद तो ब्राह्मणिकल जो मार्क्सिज्म है उसको भारत के संदर्भ में जब हम देखते हैं तो नेपाल तो क्लासिकल केस है कि यहाँ पर हिंदुस्थान कहा जाता है वो लैंड ऑफ असली हिंदुओं का स्थान है मतलब रियल लैंड ऑफ हिंदुस्तान हिंदू पीपल दो जो है द राइट टू बियर सेक्टेड थ्रेड भारत में क्या है कि भारत में भी जो हमारा जो संघी ब्रिगेड है वो इसको एक रियल लैंड ऑफ हिंदुस्तान बनाना चाहता है हिंदुस्तान बनाना चाहता है लेकिन भारतीय कम्युनिस्ट पार्टियों के साथ कि मतलब इस सवाल को जो जो जिस किस्म का नेशनलिज्म कांग्रेस ने डेवलप किया पावर में आए बाद में उसका ही एक एग्रेसिव फॉर्म में बीजेपी उसको लेके आना चाहती है लेकिन उसको चुनौती देने का जो मामला है वो कम्युनिस्ट पार्टियों का था भारतीय कम्युनिस्ट पार्टियों का इंडियन लेफ्ट का और इंडियन लेफ्ट ने उस सवाल को विकसित नहीं किया मतलब काश के सवाल को नहीं समझा पाया क्योंकि तभी जब ये सवाल जब आता है भारत माता की जय भारत माता की जय के आगे सब कुछ फेल 
खत्म आपका पास पोजीशन नहीं है आप उस जनता के सामने किस किस के राष्ट्रवाद को आप खड़ा करोगे जिसको हम कहते हैं मेहनत कस जनता का राष्ट्रवाद जिसमें कस किसान है मजदूर है बहुजन जनता है उस सवाल पर मैं आपका टिप्पणी चाहूंगा ओके okay, पहली बात तो ये है कि देखिए आई डोंट आई डोंट डिस्टिंग्विश इन कैपिटलिज्म एंड क्रोनी कैपिटलिज्म ऑल कैपिटलिज्म इज क्रोनी कैपिटलिज्म सो 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 दिस दिस आइडियल कैपिटलिज्म डजेंट एग्जिस्ट और राइट बट आई थिंक नाउ the fact is that you are talking about relation of bjp with indian capitalism and i think what has happened is that that since neoliberalism has increased inequalities dramatically a lot of the political parties and congress is one of them which at least paid some lip service if not you know actual having some actual concern with which let's say some relief for the poor and so namely nrg is after all is a kind of relief for the poor so all political parties of that kind in a sense which came out of the of the freedom struggle which the bjp did not uh have i mean you know that 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 they are uncomfortable in the era of neoliberalism i mean i i, I would say in the congress for instance while manmohan singh and jidambaram were unashamed neoliberals perhaps sonia gandhi and rahul gandhi who are talking about mg nrg as wanted to provide someone asked me a question on kalyan sanyal argument yeah you know they 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 wanted to pro pro provide some degree of support and 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 relief now the bjp is free of all that you know they 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 never came out of the national struggle they have never talked about a redistributive agenda recently in the first time in this budget jetly talked about pro poor pro pro farmer on the basis of which in calcutta the anand bazar group is actually saying modi has become a leftist <laughs> but the, but 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 you know as 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 professor chandrashekar has shown with great detail in looking at figures and so on all that is hogwash the fact that they feel the need to project an image of that kind is interesting but they have actually done nothing okay so so i think that way uh, the corporate uh, financial oligarchy finds it more comfortable to align with these people also because of the fact that in a period of crisis it becomes easier to divert attention into hindutva all this anti national and all that kind of stuff uh about the indian communists well you know let's be very clear about one thing communism is not something which is on the decline only in india it's in decline all over the world okay in france 75000 communists were executed in the second world war it had an incredible prestige when it came out of the war but where is the french communist party now the italian communist party which was another incredible party antonio gramsci's party it is it is completely decimated divided so communism is something which is on decline all over the world uh i think it's on, it, it's on the decline in my view because it was based on the assumption of an imminent revolution general crisis of capitalism revolution is coming uh, but on the other hand i think capitalism managed to uh, restructure itself in a way which actually now makes traditional communist parties is difficult for them to cope with the new situation collapse of the soviet union has actually hurt communist parties everywhere because everything said and done i mean when i was in jain you know no matter what you say there was a country in which something different was happening if that country collapses and if china go, goes in a direction where you need phd thesis to establish whether it's capitalist or communist in, in in that case in that case obviously the appeal of communism is much less and you are right uh, on this question this inability to uh, you know intermesh the caste question with the other issues the class issues and so on that it was doing uh, that it was concerned with its inability to relate to gender issues its inability to relate to issues of climate change and so on all of which required as it were a degree of 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 restructuring yourself which hasn't been done have hurt it badly but on the other hand i mean i think one of the good things i find is that at this moment i mean <laughs> frankly i think there is an upsurge among the youth and students the very fact that you have all over the country the best the best institution i mean you know jalalpur university is the best institution in 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 calcutta and jnu hyderabad and so on um is symptomatic of 
I mean, look, I, I, I remember May 68 when, when I was a student. Uh, you know, there was an enormous upsurge among students and so on in a radical direction, not necessarily in the orthodox communist direction, but in, in, in the general direction of, of thinking of left, of, 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 pro, of, of progressive ideas, of revolutionary ideas. And I think that's happening in India, and I have a feeling that that would actually rub off also on the traditional communist parties.